Whew. Holy. So I'm on my back porch, Moo back porch. It's quite the view that way. But this chair isn't over there. <laughs> I've got uh, so much stuff unloaded, carted over. Got a, a lot of trips left to go. It's about seven hours one way, I guess. You can hear that motor in the background. I bought a brand new rod of one more. <laughs> There's a lot of, we got a lot of acres here and uh, a lot of grass. And, uh, and a new weed eater. Uh, uh, you know, the one with the, the motorized weed eater. Sarah's going crazy on it. I call her, her new nickname's The Savage. Should have seen the eyes on her. She's like, I'm going to kill every blade of grass here. It's kind of funny. The previous people didn't, you could just tell that the love wasn't here from them for this place. It's kind of weird. It's amazing. It's such an unbelievable uh, location. The property's unbelievable. The home needs some work. The guy wasn't a trades guy. Um, I have been a trades guy for a lot of years. So the inconsistencies in the building and the the joints and the there's I think he basically built the place with a half a tape measure and definitely no level. <laughs> but the log home is pretty beautiful and uh, needs a lot of work. So we're already hitting on it, and I'm taking a break. I went a little a little too long and a little too hard for the past couple of days, and in, in between meals we just got wound up doing it and going for it, and we got a lot done, but. I'm taking a few minutes out to share some emails. So that's what I'm doing. And I'll, I don't know, I'm going to take and do some time lapse stuff of this place as we, as we turn it into what it should be. And I started filming. I filmed the whole place already. We made a lot of changes already in just two days. The aesthetics on the outside tore down a whole pile of fencing and stuff. And uh, one bonus, there's no mosquitoes. Oh my God. So anyway, I'm going to do some sharing here for my break because I've got so many emails and they need to be shared and uh, it's funny I've ran into probably one two three four five six people so far uh, that are familiar with the channel and just like yesterday I picked up the uh, picked up the rod of lawnmower I talked to two guys who followed the channel one of them said he has an uncle or his dad to see him when he sings just up the hill right here just like that one of the first less than a half a dozen people I speak to right and there's a new encounter story and that'll happen to you too no matter where you are if you're rural north america you start asking people straight up honestly and people talk the amount of people that are talking now is uh is is pretty cool i'll tell you what and this is how we keep everybody talking by not stopping so i'm not gonna stop you can't stop me gosh there's so many so many now i'm into the june 21 2021 folder still and there's still just a pile here that i've been read i hope that i've been read i hate it when i forget to uh i hate it when i forget to mark them as red all right here we go it's all fun and games until dear steve thanks for not letting to share my occurrence with you and anyone and everyone else a little about myself my name is b i'm a retired first responder with 25 years in the job i've developed a sixth sense over my career and it's never let me down. I'm an avid hunter, fisherman, and anything outdoors kind of guy. So here we go. Well, five years ago, my 12 friends and I were backcountry camping in the middle of winter. We all get together and camp out at least three times a year. While we we're over 30 miles from the nearest road, we camped in our favorite spot we've camped for years. Things started to change after the third night of 15. We all turned in, except for one of us, to keep the fire going and the hot cocoa warm. We each took an hour, so none of us would be overtired due to the negative temps we were in. One of the guys was sitting by the fire, and I woke up from my shift at about 3 a.m. or so. Now, mind you, all of us were avid hunters and were packing some sort of firearms under our shoulders or within close reach. While sitting on a stump on our dugout, the snow fire pit, my friend looks out past the fire and sees movement in the pines. He asked me if I saw that. I replied I didn't see anything, so he, must, so he said he must be tired and turned in. While dipping a donut into some hot cocoa, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye and looked into that direction and didn't see anything out of the ordinary besides pine branches swaying in the slight breeze. So I went back to my donut. After my shift, my bunkmate came out and took over. I stayed with him for 10 or 15 minutes and started to head to my tent. Thinking what it could be that caught my eye, I just lay there and started listening intently. Ten minutes later, I hear my friend whisper my name. He's asking me to slowly come here. I climb out of the tent and he's pointing between the tents across the way at glowing eyes. He's sitting on the stump. I was on shaking. I crawled down the path. 
I made to our fire pit since it's February, minus 24 Fahrenheit and 4 feet of snow. I sat on the ground watching them. Then they disappeared. So, now that I'm wide awake, I crawled to the next tent and woke up two of the friends and they came out to the fire pit. I let them wake up with some cocoa and told them to keep their eyes open out behind the tents which were in a circle around the fire pit. Within a few minutes, one of them said, did you see that? It was behind me, so I turned and I didn't see anything. Now it's about 4.30 in the morning. We're all wide awake. My sixth sense says to me, I know something is there, but what is it? While sitting there, I focused my hearing away from the crackling fire, listened in very deep focus. It's something I've learned over the years. I close my eyes and picture what's around mentally, and my hearing is focused to what I'm seeing. I didn't hear or see anything after that. On the fifth night, things started to get weird. We all stayed up late, I toasted our friends who were overseas or couldn't attend due to family commitments. We weren't drunk, just a nip of whiskey and our cocoa to keep warm. We all turned in, except the one on fire watch, about midnight. About 30 minutes later, my friend on fire watch called out asking if anyone was awake. My friend Mark replied, as well as I. He asked us to listen. He said he could hear footsteps in the distance by the lake we were camping near. All about 20 to 30 yards away, Mark and I climbed out of our tents and sat by the fire. I went into my listening mode and could hear faint footsteps in the snow. I listened carefully for about five minutes, and they would stop and start. I opened my eyes when my friend tapped on my knee and pointed out towards the lake. I looked at him with a confused look and looked out and saw the eyes blinking from behind a tree at 15 yards, behind the tent in the shadows. Now with the hair standing up on my neck, my sixth sense said that he's here and means us no harm, but want to know what we are doing here. I didn't say anything to my friends, but the next morning, the four friends that were fire first responders said they felt like someone was wanting to know why we were here. We were now curious to know what it was. We knew that bears were hibernating, moose were in their winter, winter feeding grounds, well, most of them, and deer were too small to be at the height and deer were too small to be at the height of these glowing eyes were. So after breakfast, we went to where we saw the glowing eyes and didn't see any footprints or any sign of life that could have been there. We all saw, we all saw where, all we saw were snowshoe prints. What are you doing? Come on up, come on up, there. come on over. This is Griffin, this is Sarah's dog Griffin. I call him a little guinea pig. What do you think, you having fun? Are you having fun? Huh? You babysitting the chicks? We got like 50 baby chickens in a pen over there and he thinks he's the babysitter. All right, jump down. Go get mom. Go get mom. Go get her. Here, come on over here. Come on. Okay, sit there. Sit down. <laughs> so after breakfast, we went to where we saw the glowing eyes and didn't see any footprints or any sign of life that could have been there. All we saw were our snowshoe prints along the trail. That made us uneasy. But we stayed and enjoyed ourselves that day. The next night started again at about 11 p.m. Off in the distance, we heard whoops and whistles and what sounded like an elephant walking through the dead pine tree branches at 40 miles per hour. It circled us about four to five times and stopped about 40 yards away. Myself and my friend John looked at each other and turned around so we could focus our eyes into the trees behind us. We both had kind of the same sixth sense and could hear every footstep in the snow walk towards us. Then the glowing eyes appeared. I just deeply focused myself into pinpointing the distance away it could be. We both said about 20 yards behind a large maple. The next morning we went to the maple tree and saw footprints and what appeared to be nail marks on the side of the tree which are horizontal with the ground. Now we're all to the point where we're thinking of leaving but decided to move to another location we scouted out about 15 miles away. All of us were frazzled a bit but calmed down and said we were seeing things. The next night it started again. Whoops, whistles, and now the breaking branches, and very loud grunts that echoed in the valley. Now we were spooked. We knew that we knew that to hike out in the dark with only minimal light from our headlamps and flashlights and propane lantern. We decided to stay the night and leave the next morning. One of the guys had sticks thrown at him. Another kept seeing glowing eyes, and I felt very uneasy, and my sixth sense is telling me to leave and leave now. A few of the guys felt the same way. It's a feeling that I never forget. We woke up the rest of the guys and packed up. We put the propane lantern in the middle of the pack as we started our 20 mile hike out at 2 a.m. We kept to ourselves, we hiked out. We could hear it walking with us. We circled back a few times to throw it off and we found footprints and circled back to head to the cars. 
the whole while being uneasy, the feel of harm, my sixth sense saying, move your ass. About 10 miles in, we stopped and had some cocoa and a rapid breakfast. The feelings by now were dissipating, we felt a sort of a calm. But we felt a feeling that nothing will harm us, and you're safe from the bad one. We continued on and arrived at the cars. We stayed in a small motel the rest of the time. To finish up, we, were, we still go camping together three times a year in the same spots. We haven't talked to our families on what happened and probably won't. <laughs> Thanks again, B. Well, you've been here, you've probably been on this channel long enough. You, uh, you know you're not alone, right? You know. you know you're not the only one this is happening to, right? It's unfortunate you're, gonna talk, you're not going to talk to your families about it. Because uh, for all you know, you never know. If you do bring it up to a family member, they just might bring up their own experience of something kooky to you too, right? And furthermore, if you know anybody who's going to be doing the same thing you were doing, or going to that same area, it's only fair to arm them with the knowledge that you have, right? I mean, it's up to you. Not too many people are secure enough to just talk about it openly and factually. But... In a way, I mean, if you if you if you are in possession of knowledge that will benefit your your neighbor, your family member, I th I think that we're all obligated to share it, right? Where I live, I can tell you right now, there is numerous sightings on that mountain right behind the the uh, camera. There's more sightings between here and the highway that goes travels west than probably anywhere I'm familiar with in BC, even more than where I just moved from. Um, there's a lot of people enjoying the outdoors. There's a lot of people who live rural. There's a lot of people with children. And uh, I just think it's very, very fair that we share important knowledge with everybody openly. But anyway, I'm tired, man. I'm starting to babble. Thanks for sending that in, all right? And I'm glad you guys are all safe and got it all right. But obviously, it's like I said before, predators don't warn you. Predators will never warn you. So if it's making noises, it's not going to hurt you. What I understand. All right, what do we got? It had an armful of apples. Hey, Steve, my name's John. This is what happened to me and my brother when I was 10 years old, and my brother Chris was 12. So, 1983-ish. It was midsummer. We lived along in, on Long Island, New York. <clears throat> it was midsummer. And we lived on Long Island, New York. Back then, before my father left, we'd take us boys camping, fishing, hunting, etc. Every fall and summer, we'd go to the Catskill Mountains. On the way upstate, we would pass all kinds of farms and would stop occasionally to go pumpkin apple picking and the like. On this day, Chris and I wandered off a bit, out of sight from our parents, towards a barn in the back 40 of this apple grove farm. In front of the barn was a hog pen with several black, rusty metal 50-gallon drums. Scattered about, some stacked, some knocked over. From about 20 yards out, we started lobbing anim apples into the hogs pen and watched them go into a frenzy, grabbing them up. We would count to three and chuck as many as we could, one after the other, for 30 seconds or so. At this point, one of the apples hit one of the drums and made a loud, deep, bong, echoing sound. We started laughing and began aiming for the drums. And just then, a few of the drums started moving. We stopped, thinking a hog was loose. As I threw an apple at the wobbling barrels, a hairy, muscular being stood up from behind the barrels and then dodged the apple I threw. No way. Which could have nailed him right in the face. He was eight feet tall, easy. As his head was in the lower apple tree branches, his hair was like shag carpeting, but more kempt. It was blackish brown with no hair on his face. He looked archaic, and his facial structure was more built than Arnold Schwarzenegger back in his heyday. It's hard to explain as he doesn't quite match up with drawings of early hominids, but that's almost a kinship type of recognition. Even though this, even through his thick hair, he ducked a few branches as he turned his back to us. He took a few steps and was like 20 feet from the tree he was under. Then he looked back at us, turning at the waist so his shoulders were almost square with us, and threw an apple back at us. <laughs> what? He made this weird, jovial whoop slash laugh that was as loud as the ambulance siren. With his head back and face to the sky, he smiled and was making his low, bass-filled, gruff-like chuckle as he turned away. 
His left arm was filled with apples, carrying them like cradling a football, and started walking toward the tree line, maybe 100 yards away. We stood in shock, my hand grabbing Chris's shirt at the sternum and twisting my first my fist scrunching up his shirt until i said what the f and swipe my hand away breaking us out of the silent shocker slash slash stopper we we're in and i took off like a rabbit running clear out of my shoes looking back every few seconds to see chris close behind and no big hairy man chasing of course upon reaching our parents we were talking a million miles an hour not a breath and my father is not one for bullshit we have none of it but as we we're off Freaking out to our mom and little brother, I saw my dad walk off around the bend with a big stick in his hand. Soon he returned with my shoes, if nothing happened, packed us up, and with a quickness, not speaking the whole time, then drove off much faster than needed. To this day, I think he saw this thing's footprints, or its silhouette in the tree line. These beings are real, period, end of discussion. I tell you, whoever, I, s I feel it relevant to do so. I tell... I tell whoever, whenever I feel it relevant to do so. If I catch an attitude from someone, I just say, so you're calling me a liar? Because it's one or the other. And if you're calling me a liar, we got a hot problem, and we'll solve that problem right here and now. And things usually take a more civil tone, LOL. Truth is not subjective, Steve. It's the truth, period. A fact, among many others, that is increasingly under attack in this post-modern, progressive, left-dominated arena. This leftist cowardly pack of limp-wristed skirts get all go shit in their hats for all I care. Showing backbone, especially regarding the truth, is paramount in today's failing society. Sorry for the rant, but I'm getting sick in the stomach and highly concerned with regards to several issues and media's portrayal and bullying of people with solid virtue and noble instincts. Incredible how honesty and integrity are either shut down and marginalized or praised because of people's surprise when you're expressing them. These virtues need to be the norm. Great job, man. Keep it up. John Geden. Geddon? Geden? John, I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name the wrong way. I don't mean any disrespect. So it's G-E-D-O-N. And I absolutely appreciate you sharing that story with all of us and all the people here. And what an incredible example, right? And obviously, uh, that being has no anger towards you. Obviously, it knew that it was full-on fluke timing. You winged that apple and just about hit him in the face. And he threw one back out of absolute uh, mutual comedy. It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. You know, if you were if you were inclined to be learning more about these things, you possibly want further contact with them. It sounds like that dude's a safe way to go, possibly, right? What an amazing story, man! <laughs> what a crazy, crazy experience. You know, your dad saw something. You know, he did. And it's too bad, people. Too bad he's not to open, talking. It's too bad he's not talking openly about it, right? I'll tell you what. By the time we're done here, we're gonna have everybody talking openly about it. You watch. We're gonna have every single person who ever heard of this topic is gonna be speaking openly about it. And matter of fact, and a lot of people are gonna feel kind of stupid after laughing at the topic so many times or belittling people, attacking people, right? What do we got? Here's another one. Let me start by saying that I've been in the mountains my whole life. When I was 19 years old while deer hunting, I found some tracks that I could fit my hand down in. They were cat tracks with only three toes. I no longer go into the woods unless it's light enough that I can see without a flashlight. When I was 36, I saw a black panther, and they say they don't exist in the eastern part of the United States, or the whole United States for that matter. The panther was silky black, and under its bottom, his chin was silver. I told my papa about it, and he said he had seen one too when he was younger while logging with horseback. This past year, I'd went to a lake close to where I deer hunt. I was sitting on a log for 45 minutes when all of a sudden I hear a big knock on a tree across the lake. Then I hear another knock about 200 yards east of the first knock. Then the knocks went back and forth about six times, and then I heard a knock on the ridge behind me. The first thing that came to my mind was those knocks came in an L shape. And that was an ambush tactic that was used in Vietnam. I never saw anything, but like I said before, I've been in the mountains my whole life. I've never heard that sound. I remember when I was 14 years old, there was this old man who had told my papa there was a hole that didn't have a bottom to it. The hole was near that lake where I heard the knocks. I didn't know if it was true or not until I found it this year. Oh, you did find it. Wow. I'm 41 now. I'll attach some pictures. Latitude is 36.407 and longitude is 
minus 83.864099. All right, latitude 36.407104. Okay, you guys, I don't have any internet connection here at all. <laughs> okay, so by the time I go to editing this, I will not be able to go back on and find those pictures. They're not, they're not attached here, unfortunately. So you can either dig up those numbers and have a look at the map, or once I get the internet again and get everything hooked up, then I will crack open emails and I'll find the photos and I will attach them. I'll share them with everybody later, all right? And as far as the Black Panthers go, I know they're down there too. A uh, buddy of mine I trust in my life from Alabama, he's seen one in Tennessee. And if he told me he saw one, he saw one. Too many people have reported those Panthers. All right. Got another one right here. Sabe on military base, Fort Stewart, Georgia. Another military base. It's endless, isn't it? I love those military bases. Steve, greeting, sir. My name is Dave. Last name withheld since I'm still in active duty. 49-year-old Army active duty station in Fort Stewart, Georgia. I'm a huge fan. Been following you since last fall. Thanks for what you're doing. Round table of knowledge. Straight to my story. First, I'm a tougher than average kind of guy. Give myself stitches, set some broken fingers and toes, etc. I once ran through a 15-mile obstacle course with a broken foot. In other words, I'm not a wimp and don't scare easily. I must have hurt. I also have hunted all my adult life, taken deer, hogs, bear, walked through all kinds of timber, mountains, jungles, without fear for my life. I've traveled all over the world, been in two wars, seen death and violence. I'm not a man that walks with fear, not until now. Last year in the fall, I was bow hunting on the base in a bow-only area that is three square miles of pine forest and swamps. I got in the area... I got in the area earlier on 4 o'clock. I like getting up my tree less than, at least an hour before first light. I like to hear what is around me and let the area settle down after sneaking through it to my tree. Right before sunup, I heard the loudest whoop sound I've ever heard. It sounded like it came from 50 yards in front of me. That was so loud, I felt it on my shirt. I just couldn't make sense of it. I was about 12 feet up a pine tree. When the sun came up, light enough for me to see, I had new growth pines in front for about 250 yards none were over six foot tall and a bunch of palmetto plants further out about 300 yards away was a huge old growth stand of pines it went for about a half a mile to my left and right i'd forgotten i was hunting deer and was fixated on trying to figure out what could have made that sound the nearest farm was five miles to myself the nearest building or workshops were about a mile behind me no one else was checked into the area we checked in on a website, and you can see how many others are hunting near you. I was alone, Steve, so or so I thought. About 10 to 15 minutes had passed since the yell. I said not to move a muscle in case whatever made the noise was within eyesight of me. I didn't want to give away my position with movement. My camo blended in perfectly with the tree and the pine needles. Then it yelled again. This time I could tell the sound was directed toward me. I now realized this first time I was just a yell. This time the whoop was in my direction and there's no mistaking this change it knew I was there it it knew it was there and it sounded louder this time I think it was coming from the pine forest 300 yards away but it sounded like it was right in front of me then I did something I've never ever done I climbed down took my climber and bow and leapt as fast as I could making sure I stayed below the six foot tall hedge of new growth I did not want this thing to see my escape route. I was actually shaken up a bit. This thing scared me more than two wars, or even my old man with a belt ever did. I was ruined for the next several weeks. I didn't know what to do. I asked some trusted friends if they'd ever heard or seen anything similar. One friend, an ex-Navy Navy SEAL, said he had some friends chased off a hunting lease near the swamp by a huge hairy thing that hollered so loud at them, some of them got sick to their stomach. I started Googling and YouTubing whoops, and now I know. That's also how I found your channel. Side note, after doing some research, there have been about four or five eyewitness reports here on this base over the last 30 years. Some were by a whole armored patrol of about 12 men. The patrol commander reported it to the range control officials. I don't know what the outcome was, but it was the third or fourth report at the time. It all scared all of them enough to sleep in their armored vehicles that night. In the summer in South Georgia... Had to have been a serious danger to make 12 man crews sleep in an oven like conditions for eight hours. I have no desire to see what made the noise, but thanks to your channel, I know what it was. 
P.S. I went back near the area in the evening after work one day and shot a nice buck. Not afraid so much now. Just check my six every few steps. Sorry about the passing, Mr. Macaroni. Hope you find only good memories when you look back. Keep up the good work, Steve. It's much needed, Dave. Dave, absolutely thank you for taking your time to share that with myself and everybody here. All right? Thank you very, very much. And uh, you know as well as I do, if you even listen to the accounts here, we have numerous, numerous people who have gone overseas, experienced war, they've been shot, blown up, they've seen every disgusting, heinous, violent act you can come up with. And 100%, 100% of the, the uh, people in the forces who have seen combat have all said that the terror from these things is, is substantially, not even in comparison to the terror they've had at war. It's much, much more intense, more scary. Isn't that bizarre? Could you imagine being able to have that skill? Like, seriously, could you imagine if we could manipulate another human being to feel that absolute terror and dread if we felt like it? I think I've said it before, but my God, I would absolutely annihilate the bad guys with that nonstop. I wouldn't stop. I'd drive every dirty politician into a loony bin. But anyway... Um, you hear any more any more accounts or any more stories or if you actually if more after what I'm after is if you hear of anything that you feel the people can benefit from hearing then make sure you get into me all right and I'll share with everybody that's what I'm after I'm after now at this point of the game I'm after knowledge obviously if you got if all you other people are you got something you want to get off your chest if you want somewhere safe to let it out this is the place but uh, I really really want people to share knowledge that'll help people i'm really after that now if you can that'd be great and that goes for everybody else listening as well all right hello steve my name is brandy alexander and i'm pleased to meet you i'm 57 and have end stage copd so i feel it's important for me to share what i know what i can and thank you very much for sending this in to us thank you for creating a place to safe for people like me to share their extraordinary ordinary experiences my first experience occurred in southwest Arkansas in the foothills of the Ozarks in 76 and I was 12 years old. We were a very poor family. In the summer, my brother and myself helped our parents cut and haul pulpwood for a living. This was back-breaking work. Because of the seasonly seasonality of the work, we often lived and were caretakers of the land and cattle to pay the rent. We were responsible for about 60 head of cattle and haying the fields. There's approximately 120 acres of land with both woods and fields. 20 head of the cattle was Brahma and the big cattle from Indiana. In a separate field was 40, 40 Hereford. It was my and my little brother's job to feed and take care of these animals. I was raised in these woods, hunting fish for all the game I could to supplement our food. I'm very aware of the various predators that have lived around me haven't seen them, including black jaguar. We owned hunting hounds, blue tick, Kalahula, walkers, and black and tans. This is important later in the telling. It was an early morning in mid-June. I called the Brahma in to their feed. I noticed there was a cow missing. I told my younger brother to stay and feed the other while I grabbed my old break-action single-shot 410 shotgun and a handful of slugs. I took two of my cat dogs, one black and tan named Doc and a Kalahula named Rosie. I walked to the northeast fence along the tree line. came up the carcass of a missing cow. When I was about 30 feet from the carcass, my dogs, my dogs tucked tail and headed towards the house. These dogs were used to hunt the panthers who preyed on livestock. They were fearless until that morning. I had to see what happened to the cow because I needed to determine if it was a threat to the rest of the herd. I was in the very back corner of the field with old growth forest on two sides. I walked up to the carcass and saw two back legs that had been snapped like twigs and half tore off. The intestines were pulled out and the liver and kidneys were missing. The head of the cow was twisted almost like completely round. As I looked to see if there was prints around the carcass, I looked into the woods. What appeared to be a large bush stood up and screamed at me. I was about 20 feet away from me. It was about 20 feet away from me and the carcass. What it looked like is forever burnt into my mind. Yes, I still have dreams about this being. It was about 8 feet tall, covered in almost black hair. It was hair, not fur. The skin was chocolate brown and you could see the skin at the knees, hands and feet. It did not have a pointed head. It was like a human head, only much larger. The face looked like an old man. It had a human nose. The mouth was wider, but human-shaped. 
The eyes had whites just like humans. I saw this clearly because it had that wide-eyed, scared look when you can see the whites of the eyes all the way around the eye. It had long hair and its head on its head and a shorter facial beard. It had large, square, human-type teeth. They were yellow like smoker's teeth. The eye color was an amber brown. It had large, square-shaped hands that had broad fingers that seemed short, like colored palms and fingernails. It smelled musty, but not horrible. Its shoulders were about four feet across, and it was muscular like a weightlifter. It looked like it weighed around 500 pounds or more. It was definitely a male. The scream was one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard coming from a living thing. It was vibrating on my insides. I had a 410 with slugs, but it never occurred to me to shoot it. I don't think it would have done anything but piss it off. When we were done screaming at each other, I took off in a dead run to the house. I didn't look to see it. I didn't look to see if it followed me. I just ran. I grabbed my brother and told him to run when I got to the feeding area. We ran to the house, closed the door, and I sit there against the door with a shotgun until my parents got home. I told my dad about the dead cow and what I saw. I got my butt busted for making up stories. He said it was a black bear and I can't be scared of what lives in the woods. I don't hold against my dad for how he reacted because I know he was scared too. He was right about not being afraid of what lives in the woods, but I have a very healthy respect now. The owner and the neighbors decided it was a bear kill and tried to hunt the bear with no results. I've had a couple of other experiences, but nothing like my 12-year-old. I've had a couple of other experiences, but nothing like my 12-year-old me screaming out of sabe. To this day, I still think it was trying to scare me away to keep me from meeting what really killed that cow. Again, thank you for the hard work you do to get the truth out there. Due to the length of this email, I'll wait to share my other experiences and observations in a different email. Sincerely yours, Brandy. Holy shit. That's quite the experience, Brandy. And make sure you uh, make sure you, sh you write an email in and share everything you got. All right? Because it's going to help somebody. And it's definitely going to help you get it off your chest and get it shared in a safe place, right? And that was a pretty incredible detailed description you gave everybody here what you saw. And it's a common one, too. Right? It's common for that descriptive to be human like this, human like that, more human this, and more human that. Incredible. But anyway, I gotta get going. We got a we got a frickin' property to work on here, and uh, I'm gonna be back shortly, and I'm gonna keep sharing. And I can't wait to get spare time going and get up into these mountains, and I'm gonna show you some new terrain. All right, and we're gonna get every single person's voice heard.